All right, I'm Chad Lee at the University of Kentucky. Today we're going to look at corn at different grow stages and seed development and talk about how those things might affect yield. Behind us we've got corn planted at three different planting dates, one in May, about mid-May, one on June 8th, and one on June 18th. A lot of corn went in late this year, and so we're doing some studies to look at that, but it also allows us to look at this demonstration of, of ear development at different stages. So let's get into the cornfield and see what we can see. So this is our latest planting date, the June 18th corn. And uh, let's get in here and see what we got. You can see it's got good green color to it at this point. It, um, it's very early on. We see a little bit of, of rust showing up on the plant right now. A bit of a concern for us. Beautiful, beautiful morning. Lots of dew. Wet corn plants. Now we're looking at the ear development on this June 18th planted corn. It's mostly in the, in the uh, dough stage. We're just getting into early dent. And if I'm walking through a field trying to assess the field conditions, I like to look at about 10 or so ears consecutively in the field. For today, we're just going to pull off a couple of these. We'll bring these out and compare these with the other ears and uh, look at some of that. But but you can't just go grab one ear in a field and look at that one ear. You've got to look at multiple ears. You want to see how the corn is behaving next to its neighbors and make sure that you've got um, a uniform assessment of what's going on. If we just go in and grab a single ear, we, almost all of us will go and we'll grab one of the better ears just, just by human nature. And so that oftentimes can give us a misleading assessment of what we see in the field. Okay, so now we moved into the spot where the corn was planted on about June 8th, and the ears are a little further along. The kernel development's a little further along. If you, the first thing you may notice, though, when you compare this spot to the other planting date, is we don't have, we, we happen just to walk into an area, we've got a few missing plants that didn't, um, didn't fully grow, maybe came up late, some other issue that caused a problem. And as a result, we don't have quite the stand here that we had in the other image. So let's keep that in mind. But nonetheless, we'll pull a few of these ears off and we'll compare these with development with the, uh, the plot that was later planted. We've got one more to go and that will be our normal planting date. And we'll look at that as well. But before we get over there, if we look at these ears, you can see a lot of silks on here still. Uh, but if I pull these off, and you might be able to see the start of a dent showing up on these ears. And about midway through, you can see some dents showing up pretty well. So we're appearing to be pretty close to the, or in, into the dent stage at this point. So not that much farther along than the corn that was planted two weeks later, um, which implies that that corn caught up to this corn. And we'll talk some more about that in a moment. On the right side of this screen is the corn that was planted on June 18th. And then as we pan over to the left side of the screen, that corn was planted on June 8th. And visually, there's not much difference in development at the edge of the field. The plants all have a good green color to them. They all look similar at this point. If you were driving by this field, you wouldn't, at this point in time, you wouldn't recognize two different planting dates at all. Um, and so that's often what we see when we plant corn later is it will go through its development stages quicker. And it even goes faster than what the growing degree day indicate. So on the one hand, it makes sense that corn planted later grows faster because we get faster accumulation of growing degree days. But this corn will also grow even faster than what the growing degree days indicate that they should. So now we're in the field that was planted at a normal timing back in the mid of May, uh, somewhere between May 15th and 18th. And it looks like these kernels have fully developed. Most likely, we'll break an ear apart here in a moment and look, but most likely we're at black layer already in this particular field. Uh, we can see some indications of nitrogen deficiency taking place, but it's taking place below the ear. And if this is truly at uh, black layer at this point, then we probably had just about the right amount of nitrogen out here. A little bit of nitrogen flare up below the ear is not a problem for us. What is a problem though, 
One of these ears has a couple of issues with it. It's got a little bit of white fungus. It's most likely diplodia. But we've also got a few kernels in here that are starting to germinate. And we see this from time to time when we have a very wet fall condition. And normally what has to happen for these kernels to germinate is they have to dry down below physiological maturity, which is roughly 35% moisture. They have to dry below that, and then they have to have enough water in the environment to get wet and go back up above that point. So you have to drop below 35% and then come back up above 35% in order to germinate. You're seeing that happen in the very upper portion of this ear. These ears are upright, as you can see. And so what that means is where those silks were all gathered up, there was enough rain that we had, frequent rains here recently, that those silks, those wet silks sat on those kernels and those kernels took up that moisture and as a result have had these small germinations. Those little sprouts will get knocked off if we were to harvest this and that's not an issue that way, but it can affect some test weight. Uh, it won't do much else for quality. The diseases though are an indication that there may be some other concerns and so we may need to check. If you saw a lot of this in the field, you'd need to check it for aflatoxins before you fed it to livestock, for example. So if you look at these ears here, they all look fairly uniform in size. They have filled out mostly to the end. Uh, a little bit of exposed ear cob on the end is usually a good thing. Historically, we say that that indicates that our population was about just right. In this particular field, we were at 38,000 plants per acre. Um, we have about 37,000 ears per acre that we see uh, in this particular field. And so we were right where we needed to be in terms of population. We were really close on nitrogen. Uh, and even though the science says that we had adequate nitrogen out here, personally, I get a little nervous when I see this much flare up. Maybe would like to have had an extra five, 10 pounds out here to get us through the season. We'll pull a few of these ears off. We'll compare these to the other planting dates so that we can talk more about development at that time. So we're looking at corn ears that were planted June the 18th. Uh, these are from June the 8th, and these are from mid-May. A couple of things you notice here. One, don't pay attention so much to the ear size. Um, those could be some slight differences just based on where we picked them out of the field. Uh, I don't want you to get the indication that we're trying to suggest that one of these is larger than another because of a planting date. That's yet to come when we get the final yields off of this. Let's start with this corn that was planted on June the 18th, the latest corn. Again, we don't recommend a June 18 planting, but the last few years we've had some heavy rain events and we have farmers that need corn to feed cattle. And so this was more to look at well, what kind of management things do we need to consider on very late planted corn? Uh, what gives us some options that way? And we we're just starting to see a few kernels starting to dent. And so this ear would still be in the dough stage, but it's probably later today or tomorrow would be into the dent stage. And so we're somewhere around 70% moisture, give or take. Um, on this side of the uh, ear, you can see that the embryo, which is white and goes almost up to the tip of the kernel. Uh, that's where the small developing corn plant is in the, in the seed, and when the, when the corn germinates, that's where it's germinating from. On this side of the seed, you don't see the embryo, but you get an idea about looking at starch and such. Now the yellow color, in this case, all of these are yellow corn hybrids. The yellow color is set, but it starts to look a little bit darker as we go through development. And if we go to the next set of ears, these are from June 8th, now we have more denting showing up uh, throughout the ear. Uh, you can see it more, more down all the way down through the rows. And so this is in the dent stage, but it's not that far ahead of the June 18th, where these were planted two weeks apart. At this point in time, there appears to be just uh, maybe a handful of days difference in actual development. And if we take a look at this ear, you can again see the, the developing embryo that's pretty much filled up that one side of the kernel. 
And on the other side, you can see a little bit darker yellow at the very tip. Uh, eventually, we're going to see a milk line where the starch layer is moving down. We call it a milk line, but at this point, we're well past the milk stage. Uh, and this yellow, dark yellow line will move down the ear as the starch gets laid in and, and hardens up the kernels. And it'll eventually make it all the way to the bottom of the ear where we get into what we call black layer. And I think we're going to see that with this set of ears planted in mid-May, a normal planting date for this part of the state. Um, one of our first planting dates where we could get in and plant corn and not mud it in, cause sidewall compaction and things like that. Um, now you can see the dents are fully developed all the way through. There's now some separation between these kernels. If you compare it to this one, see how they're all kind of nice and tight and plump and they've filled out uh, up against each other. Uh, well here, as they've started to dry out a little bit, now we're getting some separation and you can see uh, more distinct lines between those rows of kernels. And so, that, and as I pop that open, you may have heard some kernels shatter as they, um, they hit the uh, back of the tailgate. Okay, now then, see the dark distinctive milk line here. The, so you got the dark at the top, the lighter at the bottom. And so I have misjudged these plants. We're gonna have to go back and edit this out. <laughs> so these are not a black layer yet. They've got a little bit way to go. Um, being at half milk line right there, they're getting into the stage when we can start considering harvesting this for silage. Uh, used to be that we looked at milk line as our guide for silage harvest. Now it's basically whole plant moisture. Uh, newer hybrids stay greener longer or later into development and that changes when we cut those um, hybrids for silage. Uh, we want about 65% whole plant moisture, and sometimes we reach that at half milk line. Sometimes we're all the way to black layer before we get there. So if you look at um, these two ears, there's a basically a month difference in planting date between these two. But where this milk line has gotten started and moving down, this ear here is only um, maybe a, a two weeks behind in its development of this ear. So in about two weeks from now, we'll see similar, this ear will look very similar to, these kernels look very similar to these kernels. So we're getting very close development that way. Um, this is actually encouraging. When you see an ear that looks like it should be closer to black layer and it's still at half milk line, that's typically an indication that you're going to pack a lot more starch in there yet and really add to the final weight and the final yield of the corn crop. So that's actually a very encouraging development. In modern hybrids, the ear shank, what connects it to the main stalk, has gotten much, much shorter. And if you look at the ear shank, in this case, we pulled all of those husks back. This material in the ear shank is basically identical to the material in the main stalk. The husks are similar genetically to the, ear, to the leaves of the corn plant, and the husks come out in alternate fashion, just like the leaves come out in alternate fashion on a uh, corn stalk. But over time, most of these modern hybrids have this shorter ear shank, and as a result, on the shorter ear shank, these ears tend to mature upright. In older hybrids, it used to be that once you saw those ears start to fall over, then you knew you were really, really close to harvest. Today, many of these hybrids, that ear is going to stay just like this all the way through. That can pose a couple of challenges, and one of those is, is if we get extra moisture, rainfall, and it gathers on those silks, you can cause uh, some problems to show up. For example, this ear has some of those problems where you've got some sprouting taking place because you had rain that hit those silks and those silks held onto that moisture and allowed this to germinate. Now we're looking at corn genetics over time. This is an old open pollinated reeds yellow dent. Some people now refer to these as heirlooms. But this is a common parent of many, many, many modern corn hybrids uh, throughout the United States and really throughout the world. 
and you're lo looking at this next to a modern corn hybrid. And the first thing that jumps out to most people is the massive difference in ear size. And so this reed yellow dent is almost twice the size, almost twice the size of what you see on these other modern hybrid ears. And people say, well, how in the world can these be better than this? The one thing to keep in mind is there's about nine to 10,000 of these per acre. There's about 37,000 of these per acre. So even though this is almost twice the size of this, there is more than three times as many of these in the field. And so your yield is coming from that ability to handle higher population. And on a per acre basis, you have a much greater kernel number per acre with the modern type. Um, let me pull in this ear for a comparison of the two. We're talking about ear shanks. And so now you can see the difference in the ear shank length, size, and maybe even diameter of this reed yellow dent versus uh, a modern hybrid here, where you've got a shorter shank, it's narrower, thinner, um, still strong enough to hold an ear, but what breeders have done over time is they have selected for traits that produce as much grain as possible without those ears falling off the plant, without the plants falling over. And so you see a shortening of that ear shank as part of that change in time. Now I have some other heirlooms next to it. These are a couple more out of the reeds. Um, this ear, and I, what I did is I just grabbed ears um, without, and, and pulled the husks off and set them on the back of the truck. And so um, I didn't go through and look for really good or really bad ears. This is just what I grabbed going through the field. This one has some diplodia in it, some disease issues going on. Um, most of that ear would, would definitely need to be uh, analyzed for aflatoxins. Another ear uh, that had very poor pollination. We don't know the cause of it. We just know that it did not pollinate. You see a lot of blank, um, blanks across this ear. We have a hickory king white. There's also a hickory king yellow, but you'll see on occasion, you see like a dark blue or a purple here. There's a, a yellow one here. And so the white is a recessive trait. And in these cases, we've had a blue corn pollen that has come in and fertilized these areas and given us that blue tint. Uh, if you look at this hickory king, again, some poor pollination taking place. In this case, some kernel abortion that actually took place here. Um, we had adequate moisture throughout the season on this. It got really hot there for a little bit. Uh, maybe that's what's, what's happened here to, to, to shorten um, the development of these kernels. But there really wasn't severe stress uh, to, to take place this year. And so this makes this very confusing for us to look at. This is another Hickory King. They should be nice, even pretty rows. And we've got some weird things going on with our road development in through here as well. And so we obviously, obviously dealt with a little bit of stress on this uh, throughout the field that really affected these heirlooms more so than others. Now, right next to it, this is also looking at the kernels. This is also a Hickory King white that is almost totally blue. You've got one or two kernels standing out that are still white, but almost everything else on this ear was pollinated by blue corn right next door. And so accidentally, here we have produced a hybrid. So we had a, a, a female trait that was Hickory King white. We had a blue dent uh, neighbor to it. And we ended up with essentially what would be here hybrid seed. And if we were to, to grow these out, if we were to collect all these seeds and grow them out, we should get some segregation in the offspring where we have about three quarters of it being uh, this blue or purplish color and about one, one fourth, one quarter being white in that regard. Um, the ability to make hybrids, the ability to make hybrids and end up with ears like this is what greatly improved yield, uh, durability, and, and yield stability within corn. You'll hear some people from time to time say, well, these open pollinators are more resilient to dry weather, or they're more resilient to something else. And that's, that's not correct. Um, these modern hybrids went through the same environment, the same stressors. 
that these went through, and yet you've got this compared to this. Um, so these older heirlooms don't yield anywhere as well as a modern hybrid. Uh, the only time that they might yield as well, and where someone might say that there's yield stability, is if everything gets dropped back to about 30 bushels per acre. Well, then on a percent basis, yes, the modern hybrid had a yield potential of 200, and it dropped down to 30 because of severe drought, typically, or other type of stress. And the open pollinated may have gotten 30 at the same time in that kind of a system. And that's where someone makes the argument, well, see, there's more yield stability in the heirloom. But I would argue that on a regular basis, this is gonna get us 200 or more. This is gonna get us somewhere around 30 to 50. These reeds, yellow dents, they may get us as much as 70 in some, some years. And so these are closer. But again, 200, 230, 240 versus 70. And so the yield potential and the yield stability is with the modern hybrids. Uh, even though a lot of the genetics, original genetics, came from open pollinators like reeds yellow dent.